I recently went through the process of applying for a new mortgage on another home that my wife and I are buying. And in the process, I had to turn over every detail about my financial picture. I mean, everything. They wanted to know deposits, where the money came from, where my money was going, and I had to turn over all of my bank accounts to them. And in the process, the lady who was processing the loan, I'm sure, learned a great deal about my life. Had she wanted to go deeper, she would have learned everything. Looking at one's register, their checkbook, looking at one's money, can determine a great deal about one's values and what they value in their life. Jesus Christ said, where your money is, there your heart is also. This lady came to know a great deal about me. What does God know about your heart, about your values, and what you hold dear? How dear is your money to you? On this program, on Beyond Today, we're going to look at a subject that tells us something about the most important relationship that we have in life, our relationship with God. We're going to look at tithing, a law that tells us about our heart toward God. So join us on this special presentation of Beyond Today as we explore tithing, God's financial key to success. Join our host, Darius McNeely, on Beyond Today. I learned about tithing when I was a, a young man. And to be honest, I've tithed virtually all my adult life. But at times, as I have explained the principle, the law of God regarding tithing and financial management to people and have studied the subject in the scriptures, I've certainly brought that question back on to me as to why I tithe. Why is it that I go through this regimen, this process, this part of our relationship with God that God has regarding tithing? And it comes down to several reasons that I'd like to share with all of you here this afternoon. It has to do with more than just really money and more than the amount. Ultimately, when you look into the subject, it has to do with one's relationship with God. Now, let's get a quick definition of what we are talking about when we talk about tithing. It's very simple. It's an old English word that really means 10%. 10% of one's income, 10% of what one has, 10% of one's wealth. Uh, a tithe is a, a tithe off of an increase, or uh, you could just as well say perhaps tenthing, but uh, the, the old English is tithing, and it's really talking about 10% of one's income, and it is a teaching that is found within the Bible. What it really comes down to, as I have learned and thought about it through the years and have refined this and so many different explanations and examinations of the subject because it is a, a central teaching of God's way of life and of, of the scriptures, I have come down in my own mind to center this upon one person, one personality in the scriptures uh, that we all know very well as to where I take my cue and what I go back to at times to really refresh myself in my thinking about this matter of tithing. I tithe because a man named Abraham, who was introduced very early in the scriptures, a man who was called the father of the faithful, I tithe because Abraham tithed. And I believe that his example sets the tone for a fundamental approach that we might have toward this very important part of God's law, God's teaching, and God's work in our lives in bringing us into a relationship with Him. The story of tithing begins in Genesis chapter 14. And again, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. We'll look at, uh, briefly at this story that centers around an episode early on in the life of Abraham after he has left his home, gone into what uh, we know today as the land of uh, Israel, Palestine, or the Holy Land. And he has set up his home he has divided it in one sense uh, off from his, his nephew Lot, and there came a skirmish between some of the cities and some of the peoples, and Abraham's nephew Lot got caught up and captured, was a prisoner of war. And in Genesis chapter 14, we read of Abraham saddling up his troops and going off to ransom and to bring back his nephew Lot. And in the process, there were spoils of war, as there always are any time there's a skirmish between peoples. And in the story, as we see this beginning to develop and come back in, in Abraham's life, the story picks up here in Genesis chapter 14, verse 17 and 18, as Lot as, and Abraham come back. And there's one other interesting figure that comes into this, and that's told to us, to us here in verse 17, the king of Sodom 
who came out to meet Abraham and Lot as he was coming back after the defeat of those who had captured Lot. And they kind of had a, a gathering and a, a parlay here at this particular point. And then another individual is in, introduced into the story in verse 18. A mysterious figure by the name of Melchizedek in verse 18. It says, this Melchizedek, who was the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. And he was the priest of God, most high. And he blessed him. And he said, this Melchizedek pronounced this blessing upon Abraham. Blessed be Abraham of God, Abram of God, the Most High, the possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And then at the end of the verse here, in verse 20, it says, He gave him a tithe of all. It means Abraham gave to this Melchizedek a tithe of what he had. The king of Sodom here said to Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I've raised my hand to the Lord God most high, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will take nothing from a thread to a sandal strap. I will not take anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abraham rich, except only what the young men have eaten and the portion of the men who went with me. Now this is a compact story, but it's very interesting. And there are several lessons for us to learn here in regard to this subject of tithing as it is introduced really into the flow of the Bible and the story of the Bible through the example of Abraham giving a tithe to this individual by the name of Melchizedek. Because right here we begin to see the character of the man Abraham, who is also going to become, as we know from the story later on, the father of the faithful. Here we really learn a lesson about where one's true heart is. Because Jesus Christ was going to ultimately make a statement later on, and he said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so with this example of Abraham, we begin to see exactly what it is that we are talking about in regard to, to this. He gave a, to Melchizedek a tithe of the spoils of the battle. And this individual here, this king of Sodom, kind of said, you know, uh, Abraham, he, he began to, to try to negotiate with, with Abraham in this story. And, he said, to the, he said to him, you know, leave the goods and, and you, you bring the people. You take the goods and I'll take the people. And you have to imagine perhaps that this king of Sodom was kind of a godfather type character. And I can almost hear him saying here in, in the, uh, you know, the background, leave the guns, bring the cannolis. But this is an individual Abraham didn't want to have anything to do with. Not at all. He said, I've raised my hand to God. I've made a compact and an oath with God and a promise there. Because between Abraham and God, there was a, a divine relationship, a cord, if you will, that was not going to be severed. And Abraham was not going to partner with anyone else. He wasn't going to owe any other man. He was going to owe his complete devotion, his entire relationship with God. It was, God was Abraham's partner in every detail of his life. And so he was going to avoid the entanglements that came with this particular relationship that would have, in terms of a financial dealing with a, a man, because his partner in his relationship ultimately was with God. And you also see in this story that Abraham took care of his men. So we see Abraham tithing here to this individual called Melchizedek. And it's really a story of, of character and obedience. He wanted to be owned by God, not any other man, not any other individual. And in this character, Melchizedek, Abraham saw the God whom he had left home to follow. Abraham had left all that he had. And really, when you understand the whole story, this Melchizedek was a manifestation of Jesus Christ before his human conception and birth. He's presented here as the king of, of Salem and the priest of the Most High God. We're going to come back to this character of Melchizedek in a, in a few moments here at the end of the, the program. But we see that Abraham is giving a, a tithe, the 10% of what he has, as an act of worship. It's hard, you know, for a modern mind to really think about giving 10% as an act of worship, but that's exactly what it is, and that's what Abraham was doing here. And in this act of worship, God learns something about Abraham, just as He learns something about you and I when we order our financial affairs and our heart around the treasure of our lives and get God in the right perspective there. God truly learns where our heart resides. Now, because this is such a key subject, we have developed a booklet that thoroughly explains tithing as God intended it to be. This booklet, What the Bible Teaches About Tithing, unlocks this vital key of financial management. 
This booklet explains God's basic law on tithing with a clear explanation of Scripture and why tithing should be a foundational part of your financial plan. If you're struggling financially, never able to get out of debt, and on sound footing, then you should examine what God says and put Him to the test. God says in Malachi, prove me now herewith. Tithing is something that you must prove God on. And when you do, you're on your way to financial stability and most importantly, building a relationship with God that is based on faith. To request it, call 1-888-886-8632. 1-888-886-8632. Or you can go online to beyondtoday.tv. I also want to tell you about a very important event that you're going to want to mark on your calendar. The United Church of God is sponsoring a series of Kingdom of God Bible seminars. These are being held in major cities across the United States and in Canada, Australia, and around the world. At these seminars, you will hear in-depth presentations about the central Bible teaching of the Kingdom of God. Each seminar is different. If you attended the last one, you're not going to want to miss the next in this series. Go to beyondtoday.tv and look for the Kingdom of God Bible Seminar link to find a seminar near you and register to attend. There's another purpose that God has for tithing. It's really to support the work that He is doing on this earth. God has a practical side. He's not left the most important work on earth, the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom, without a means to be financed. This is also something that I learned very early in life. My mother taught me about tithing, and she taught me to put aside a small portion, 10% out of the allowance that I would get, and when I began getting a, a small check for the jobs and chores that I would do, I put that money aside and learned that very early on life. And I also learned that where that tithe was to go in terms of supporting the work of God. That's a very practical reason. Therefore, another reason, really, that I tithe and following the example of Abraham is to support the work of God. Tithing really defines a Christian way of giving to God what he says is his to be used for the support of the most important work on the face of the earth and the most important work through the ages. We see it embedded within the various laws within the scripture. There is, there is stated in the Old Testament, the, the law of tithing in Leviticus chapter 27 and verse 30 where it says, all the tithe of the land, whether the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. You look at that and you, you learn that what God says is His, that first 10%, is holy. And that again begins to redefine how we look at physical things, how we look at what we, we have even in our own wherewithal to deal with and to parcel out and to spend on those things that we realize. When God says that 10% is His and the first 10% and it's a holy matter, that redefines not just the tithe, but it redefines a, a way of life. Now we see that God gave this here to the Levites uh, in Numbers chapter 18 and verse 21. He apportioned that to the Levites under, in the Old Testament who had the responsibility of doing the work of God within the, the temple, the, the tabernacle that was set up in, in that system. They were a group that also were set apart, holy, and belonged to God. Today, God's command to tithe is really a means by which Jesus Christ does His work through the spiritual body of the church. The church has a divine commission to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God. You know, virtually every religious organization, no matter what their particular beliefs, when they set themselves up, they, they have to be funded by money in some way. You can say Christian giving, you can say giving, you can say partnering, you can use all kinds of phrases, but in the reality, when you come back down to it, it's what God says in the Bible that is really the most efficient, the most effective, most practical, and the most correct, and that is a system of, of tithing that God placed within the Scriptures. It is His way, and it really is the best way, because there are expenses to that particular responsibility, but God is very specific in the scriptures as to how to do it. And I've noticed that sometimes with a little bit of amusement over the years, how various organizations will work around that, but all come back to recognizing that whatever work they may be involved in doing as they, they feel committed to do so, it has to require a commitment. What I've learned is that it is a folly to abandon this true way of God and to try to substitute another way. Tithing helps us when we get that 
in perspective to develop some very, very good habits of stewardship, of selflessness, understanding that what we have been given is ours to, to make certain decisions on and to work with, but what we do with God's then de determines the other 90% that we have allotted to us, or yes, I understand, a little bit less because of taxation in our systems today, but whatever we have left over, then it's going to make us better stewards with exercising a little bit more patience in terms of how we accumulate our money and how we use it and wisdom and, and how we spend it and the priorities that we place upon what we have left for our discretionary use as well. All of this really develops what is an important ethic, a godly ethic toward money, wealth, in whatever form and shape that it, that it comes to us. And I've come to understand that this really is the most important matter for us to, to develop. Uh, it is that ethic toward money, and it is based upon a, a living law. It teaches us to live within our means. You know, you can make a lifetime study of, of economic theory and how nations work and how incomes and wealth are, is generated and how it is managed. And no matter what it comes down to, you find that there are many different systems that human beings have tried to govern themselves by over the years. And as we watch what is taking place in our world today, especially in the United States and in Europe, with one crisis after another, especially since 2008, beginning to unfold over us, we see an economic crisis that began in, in 2008, a, a subprime housing crisis where people had made certain decisions with money and got in over their head in regard to housing and, and other decisions there. We see in Europe today a problem that is continuing to develop that is threatening to reshape the, the global economy. Leaders meet, they try to come up with solutions to solve an economic crisis, and one summit, one meeting, one theory after another crumbles and folds, uh, and it patches together something that gets us on for another five years, another 10 years, maybe another 40 years, but the cycl cyclical nature of economic history teaches us that at some point, things are gonna rise and they're gonna crash. Things are gonna rise and they're going to crash. And when you really look at it and you come back down to it, what, you, what you're looking at is a, a world of, of differing economies under various nations, under various forms of governance that are not founded upon some of the most basic spiritual principles of economic theory that we find in God's Word. And tithing is one of those principles, one of those laws that govern the economic affairs of people and nations and whole systems. And when that is not in place, so many other matters are layered on top of it to create problems that cause us to have the economic ups and downs and the cycles that we see in our history or even in our personal lives, which many of us have gone through, and many people have, of bankruptcy, of insolvency, of having a lot of money and having very little money. God's systems, God's ways produce a system that has a balance and an evenness to it that avoids the extremes of debt, that avoids the extremes of indenture, slavery, economic slavery and servitude, and the problems of rises and falls of economies that we look at throughout history. The various matters that we are dealing with and seeing in the headlines of our own time show us that. Understanding how God teaches us individually to put Him first and to pay Him what He claims as His teaches us a very important lesson that he wants impressed upon us to not get caught up in greed, not get caught up in a way of life that avoids giving to others. God wants us to be liberal with the physical aspects of our life, but first to be liberal toward him. We're in a time of seemingly unsolvable world financial crisis that begs for solutions. And it seems the wise of our world meet and meet without coming up with any workable solutions that guarantee a, an economic security. And there's real fear among people today. Some feel that it will work out. Others wonder if they're, in their own lifetime things will ever be the same again. When we develop a relationship with God that is, has as one of those fundamental keys this law of tithing, we are then getting ourselves set in our framework, in our mental framework, toward, uh, away toward God that looks to Him as the, the creator, the giver of all, and it forms a very highly integrated way of life that involves many elements that define our worship, 
and our relationship with God. Tithing is really a means of walking in the steps of our faithful, spiritual father, Abraham. And we're told in, in the scriptures, especially in the New Testament, that we are the spiritual children of Abraham. If we are Christ's, we are told, then we are the seed of Abraham. His heart was fully with God, and he showed it by giving a tenth of his treasure. He showed a lot of other things as well, but this is one very important part. The question for us is, is our heart in the same place as that of Abraham's? Now, when you go online today to get this booklet on tithing, we're also going to give you a subscription to The Good News magazine. The Good News contains articles on how to have a better marriage, prayer, managing your personal finances, discovering God's purpose revealed in the Bible, and how to make sense of an increasingly confusing world. The Good News is an extension of what you see here on Beyond Today you will come to treasure this magazine as a regular source of information about today's world and motivation to live the gospel of the kingdom of God. Request your free copy by calling 1-888-886-8632. That's one 886 8632 or go online to beyondtoday.tv. I said that we would come back to this story of Melchizedek and Abraham, because there's another episode that tells us a little bit more about this, and especially in, in this law of, of tithing, and it's in the book of Hebrews, chapter 7, where the writer, the Apostle Paul, brings out this fact of this Melchizedek once again. And I mentioned that understanding who this Melchizedek figure was is very important. He was a manifestation of Jesus Christ at that time, before his human conception and birth. And we find that he is referenced again here in Hebrews, chapter 7, and verse 1 where it says that this Melchizedek, the king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness and then also the king of Salem, meaning king of peace. Now we're not going to get into the whole story and the explanation for Melchizedek. That would take a whole other program and, and uh, time as well. But what we find once again here is that it's recognized that Abraham paid his tithes to this individual, Melchizedek. And in this, we see it mentioned several times as you go down through chapter 7 of Hebrews in verse 4, consider how great this man was to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. And then it goes into really an explanation to show how this matter of tithing is then handed over in the New Testament and for our purposes today to a, a priesthood that is after the order of Melchizedek. And the writer is basically showing here that Levi received tithes. Abraham paid those. Uh, the Levi even paid those in advance through Abraham. But there is a different priesthood. There has been a change that takes place. And verse 11 shows that there is a changeover of another priesthood according to the order of Melchizedek and not according to the order of Aaron. So what he is showing here. Once again, Abraham gave his tithes to, uh, to Melchizedek, this one he, whom he recognized as God. And today, the church being the spiritual body, a, a community without borders, a spiritual organism, receives that, those tithes and that blessing uh, that also are used then to carry on the work of preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. It's, what is interesting to note, is you find the story brought up once again within the context of the book of Hebrews, which is a very important chapter about faith. It also talks about the Sabbath. It talks about the law of God. It talks about Jesus Christ as our high priest. Many examples of faith are brought out here as well. And that is what is fascinating to consider that even tithing gets its, its, its billing here within the story in the, in the book of Hebrews and in chapter 7 to talk once again within the context of faith and a practical demonstration, an aspect of our life that shows where our heart is and our relationship with God, just as Abraham did that. Tithing is a, is a key to define a very deep faith and reverence toward God. That's what we are seeing when we look at the story here of Abraham who tithed to Melchizedek and set the example as the father of the faithful. There's a larger lesson that is drawn here from all of this. I have sat and talked with people 
many, many times over the years and taught them these principles out of the scriptures and helped them gain a measure of, of basic financial stability based upon God's word. I'm not a financial uh, analyst. I'm not a financial expert in terms of, of budgeting or finance in, in that particular way. Although I do know a little bit about what God says as a fundamental principle within His Word. And I know what works because it has worked in my life and I see that it indeed works within the lives of individuals who step out and put God to the test. Tithing is not a means of getting something from God. Tithing is not a bargain that we make with God. It's not a form of an insurance policy that we make where we give God something we expect anything in return. Uh, we have analysts and stockbrokers and financial planners to help us advise on what we do with our money in that particular way. Tithing is something that defines a very deep personal relationship with God, and it works. And when, when we get that part right, then we are on the way toward a financial stability in our life. When we apply other fundamental principles and under fund, other fundamental laws that define financial stability, then we're on our way toward a, a better life. But most importantly, we're on our way toward a deeply personal life of worship toward God. Tithing represents God's claim on our total life. Now remember our free literature, the offers that we've made today. Our booklet, What the Bible Teaches About Tithing, free of charge, and also the Good News Magazine. Both of these are absolutely free. There is no follow-up from any of us that will ever come to request money. That may seem strange on a program where we're talking about tithing, but it illustrates that what I've been talking about today. We're able to provide our literature free because the faithful generosity of others makes it possible. Because others in faith practice tithing and giving as a way of life, we can do this program and give you this literature. So call 1-888-886-8632, 1-888-886-8632, or go online to beyondtoday.tv. And don't forget to sign up for the Kingdom of God seminars through the link that you'll find on the Beyond Today site. I tithe also because it is both a law and a blessing and a barometer, and a guide, and a privilege, and an honor. I tithe because it finances God's work on earth today. I tithe because Abraham, the father of the faithful, tithed, and I want to follow in his footsteps. Why do you tithe? That is the first question to ask and for all of us to answer. That's our program today. I'm Darius McNeely. Thanks for watching. For the free literature offered on today's program, go online to beyondtoday.tv. Please join us again next week on Beyond Today.